Okay, in this section, P.4 factoring part two, we're gonna concentrate on working with the trinomials with binomial factors. So you basically have two terms times two terms. And after you distribute everything out um, and you combine your like terms, you will end up with this trinomial, okay? Now there's a few different methods. One of those methods is called trial and error where you basically take factors of this first number and you place them in there. And then you take factors of the back number and you place them in there. And then you foil out all the different options until you get one that gives you the exact middle term that you're supposed to have, okay? That is called trial and error. Um, I don't particularly teach trial and error just because it's not really a method to factoring for me. It's really just a method of like, like what it says, trial and error. Like you're just guessing what the answer could be and then maybe hopefully one of them works, right? Um, I like to know whether or not it's going to factor, first of all, without doing all of this extra work and then the whole thing is prime and it's not gonna factor, right? Um, it can get a little frustrating if you have like 15 different possibilities and you're trying all of them and none of them work. That's a lot of work for no reason, okay? Or what if there's an, uh, like 60 possibilities? Are we really gonna sit there during a test and try all 60 possibilities, right? Um, it's not likely. So they took it easy on us. They gave us a number with only two sets of factors, one times six and two times three and five, which only has one set of factor, which means you can only have six possibilities, okay? Or four possibilities, I'm sorry. Um, and so that's great and all, but it really does not help me. Um, what if this number had 15, had six possible factors? And what if this number here had, you know, four possible factors. Now I'm gonna have like 20 possible answers, okay? And so trial and method is really not ideal in this um, instance, okay? But essentially what you would do is you would take these six and one. So notice they put the factor of six and the factor of one and here they did it again. Then they put the factors of two and three and two and three. And then notice they have five in front, one in the back and then they switched it. And then one in the front, five in the back, and then they switched it just so that I could get every combination. Now, they also put plus signs in between every single term, okay? And that has to do with the signs here, okay? So what I tell people is if you have ax squared plus bx um, plus c, then you know that your factors are going to both have pluses in the middle, okay? Okay. If you have ax squared plus bx um, minus c, then you're going to have one with the plus and one with the minus, but the bigger value is gonna be here. Okay. Um, and then if you have ax squared um, minus bx minus c, then that tells me you're gonna have one with the plus and you're gonna have one with the minus, but the larger number is gonna go there. And then finally, if you have ax squared plus bx, but, or no, I'm sorry, minus bx and a minus plus c. Well, if the factors are supposed to multiply to give you a positive, but add to give you a negative, then that means that they're both negative, okay? And so it's just a way to kind of know what the signs are gonna be if you are gonna do that guess and check method, okay? Essentially, if it's a plus sign, they're gonna be the same, right? If it's a plus sign, they're gonna be the same. And then the one in the middle tells you what it's gonna be in the middle. So if that's a plus, they're gonna be the same, but if that's a plus, they're gonna both gonna be plus. Here, the minuses tell you you're gonna have different. One's gonna be plus and one's gonna be minus. But since the middle one is positive, that means the larger number would need to go where the positive is. And since here, the bigger one is negative, that means the larger number is gonna to have to be negative. And I have to be careful because it's really the larger number with the insides give you the larger number. And for here, the outsides will give you the larger number. Okay, so it's very, very tricky. Um, 
So, but instead of learning all of that and memorizing all of that, I have a whole nother method that I like to show people, okay? Um, so they're just showing you that if you would have multiplied all of these, it just so happens that this is the only pair that actually distributes out and combines into the original. And so then that means that this is the factorization of that um, polynomial up there, okay? Um, So they're going to first talk about factors with the leading coefficient is one, which means there's no number in front. Now, when there's no number in front, you can follow this process, and it is very much similar to the same process that I'm going to show you when there is a number in front, but it's just a lot shorter if you work with this one, okay? And so how do they come up with this list of stuff? I don't even do this thing here and then try to guess which one's the answer. What I do is I take, if there's no number in front, what is one times 12? It's just 12, right? And so what I do is I take the 12 and I start trying to figure out all of its um, factors, okay? Now, if you wanna know how far down the list you have to go to guarantee that you have all the factors here, I take the square root of that 12. And so if I do take the square root of 12 and type in a decimal, I get 3.4 something or another. So three is as far down as I'm going to go in this list, okay? And so how do I figure this out? Well, 12 divided by 1 is 12. And that's because 1 times 12 is 12. 12 divided by 2 is 6 because 2 times 6 is 12. 12 divided by 3 is four, and that's because three times four is 12, okay? And so from this list of factors, you wanna find the factors that add to give you a negative seven result, okay? And so notice that if I'm gonna have to add and get negatives, okay? First of all, we do know that if this number is a positive, then these two numbers are gonna be the same sign. So they're either going to both be positive or they're going to both be negative. And since I'm supposed to have a negative result, that tells me that both of these columns should be negative. Okay. And so then which of these would add to give me negative seven? Negative one plus a negative 12 is negative 13. So that's not the pair. Negative two plus negative six is negative eight. So that's not the pair we're looking for. Negative three plus negative four does equal negative seven. So this is the pair that we are looking for, okay? And since the number in the front is a one, we automatically know that there's gonna be a one and a one in the front. And so you can literally just write X negative three or X minus three, and then X negative four or X minus four. Okay, and then you have this factorization already. Okay, so this will be the process that I use to factor um, problems that have a one in the front. Okay, so it says sometimes polynomials with more than three terms can be factored by grouping. Okay, um, and so we'll talk about what grouping is. Essentially, what grouping is, is you're cutting the problem in half. Remember that that minus is the sign of this 3x, okay? So when I chop it off, I can't chop it off here because that sign goes with this number. You have to chop it off in front of that minus. And then essentially what you're doing is you're asking yourself, what do these two guys have in common? They have an x squared in common. And so if I factor that x squared out, x squared times x is x cubed, and x squared times a 2 is 2x squared. Then over here on the other side, whatever symbol is here must come down. If it's a plus, it must come down. Then what do these two guys have in common? They have a three in common. But notice that it's a negative three that you're factoring out. So a negative three times a positive x gives me negative three x, and a negative three times a negative two gives me a positive six. And then you notice that I have the same thing that they do, right? It's just I have a bar in the middle. 
you'll notice that this left side and the right side both have this x minus 2 in common. So if I took the x minus 2 out, I would only have x squared. And if I took that x minus 2 out, all I would have is the x minus or the minus 3. Okay. And this is not a perfect square, so I can't use my difference of uh, squares formula here. It's just going to stay like this. This is the final factorization. Okay. Um, so for factoring by grouping, the first thing you want to do is factor um, anything any common factors using the distributive property, um, then factor according to one of the special formulas, and then you factor this according to this. Um, there's really two different things here. I'm gonna go over this process. I have not gone over that process. The only one I've gone over is this one. We have not addressed what happens when there's a number in front. It's a whole process, okay? But this is how you would do it. The first step is to always factor out a common factor throughout the whole polynomial if you can, okay? Then if you have two terms, you'll see if you can factor according to one of the special polynomial forms. If you have three terms, then you'll factor using the method we learned for this one or the method we're going to learn for this one when there's a number in front. And then if there's four terms, then you factor it by grouping, okay? Um, we just haven't gone over both of the processes for three terms. We've only gone over the process when there's no number in front. It's like an invisible one, okay? But when there's a number in front that's not one, it's a little bit different, okay? Similar, but different. So um, they actually are going to just gloss right over it. So I am going to have to address it. So give me one second. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you that method on how to factor problems when there is a number in front. And it doesn't matter how small or how large this number is in the front, you will get the answer, okay? So the, it's called the AC method is what it's called. And you'll notice that when I was doing the problem that had a one in the front, I did something that you're gonna have to do all the time. Notice when we did this problem, I took that one and I multiplied it by 12, and that's the number that I started factoring out, okay? That's why it's called the AC method, because normally it's AX squared plus BX plus C. So essentially what you're doing is you're taking the A times the C, and that's why it's called the AC method. And so when I take 12 times 15, actually 12 times negative 15, 12 times negative 15 is a negative 180, okay? And so I've got to factor out this negative 180. What is the square root of 180? Don't put a negative because you won't be able to do the square root of a negative. But I do get 13 point something, okay? So that means I'm going to go down this list all the way to 13. And as tedious as that may be, it's a whole lot less tedious than trying to get all the factors of this, all the factors of that, all the combinations of the two, and then guess and check every single entry, okay? So 180 divided by one is 180. 180 divided by two is 90. 180 divided by three is 60. 180 divided by four 
is 45. 180 divided by five is 36. 180 divided by six is 30. 180 divided by seven is a decimal. So this is not going to be a pair. 180 divided by eight is another decimal. So this is not going to work. 180 divided by nine is 20. 180 divided by 10 is 18. 180 divided by 11 is a decimal. 180 divided by 12 is 15. And 180 divided by 13 is a decimal. So already we outruled about four of those options, right? Um, another thing that we have to consider is if I'm going to end up with a negative 180, that means one of these numbers does need to be a negative. But how do I know whether it's going to be the smaller numbers or the larger numbers? Okay, that you tell by the middle sign. Remember, I'm supposed to combine these, add these together and get a positive 11. Well, when I'm adding, in order for me to end up with a positive, it means the bigger number would have had to have been positive. So this right here will tell me the sign of the bigger column. So that means that these are all gonna be positive. So in order for me to multiply to get a negative 180, that would mean that all the smaller numbers would need to be negative. So you do have to think about those signs for just a moment before starting to figure out the results. And so this is super ridiculous because there's no way that's gonna give me 11, right? That gives me 179, it's way too big. I think I'm gonna start from the bottom going up because I think I will get numbers closer to the 11. So negative 12 plus 15 is actually positive three, that doesn't work. This gives me eight, that doesn't work, but we're getting closer, right? nine plus a positive 20 is 11. So this is the pair that works. Okay. Now remember, when there's no number in front, I would simply say that the answer is x minus nine and x plus 20. But if I were to foil this out, I will not ever get this 12 in the front. I will just get x squared and that's it. So this is definitely not the way to go once you get those factors. You can go straight to the answer when there's no number in front. But when there is a number in front, it's a whole nother process, okay? And we had to talk about grouping first before we can talk about this next process. So essentially what you're going to do is you're going to take these three terms and turn them into four terms using this breakdown, okay? I know that I can get positive 11x by combining a negative 9x and a positive 20x using these numbers, right? So if I were to combine those, I would get positive 11x. And then just bring down constant and bring down that first term, 12x squared. And now that you've turned it into a four-term problem, you must use grouping in order to factor a four-term problem. So I'm going to chop it off here because that plus sign belongs to the 20. And these two both have an X in common, and they can both be divided by 3. So then 3X times 4X gives me 12X squared, and 3X times 3 gives me 9X. Whatever this symbol is, I must bring it down. These two don't have an X in common, but they both can be divided by 5. So it's a positive five that I'm using. So positive time five times a positive four X will give me positive 20 X and a positive five times a negative three will give me a negative 15. So then the left side and the right side both have this four X minus three in common. And so if I took that out, all I'd be left with is three X and the plus five. And then this is the actual factorization. And if you wanted to check it, you could FOIL it all out. So 4x times 3x is 12x squared. 4x times 5 is 20x. Negative 3 times 3x is negative 9x. And negative 3 times 5 is negative 15. And I do get the original polynomial or trinomial, 
so it does work out okay so super super important that you understand that process it is lengthy but I promise you that the bigger that this number gets and the bigger that that number gets and the bigger this gets as a result, the harder it is to do it during that trial and error process, okay? So I don't like to waste too much time on going into too far depth with that um, process. I like to show a process that works no matter what. Now, here's the big question. Sometimes you can get problems that are prime. So remember I mentioned, if you're doing the trial and error, if you have 60 different possibilities, um, here I had what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different possibilities. And you would have had to foil out all nine of them to see which one was gonna give it to you, okay? Instead of foiling out all nine of those possibilities and then finding out that none of them worked, um, if you go through all of these factors and none of them add to give you that middle term, that's how you know it cannot be factored. You took the square root, you know that the list only goes down to 13 and none of these worked, then you know it's prime. You don't have to sit there and multiply out nine different pairs that you had to think to put together in the first place. And then just to come out that you wasted all that time because it was prime, okay? So that's the method that I like to show when I'm doing these problems. So we're going to go through this now. Look at this problem. It does have, um, it does tell me exactly what it wants me to do. It just wants me to factor out the common factor. So I do notice that all three of these guys have a Z. So I am going to factor out that Z. And then when I do factor that Z out, oh, I also notice that all of them have a factor of two. So I can factor out two Z. So then two Z times a Z squared will give me a two Z cubed. And I have a minus sign. So two times two will give me a four, but I need Z times a Z to give me a Z squared. I have a plus sign. Two times three will give me six. And I already have the Z, so I don't need any more variables. Okay, and that's all they asked me to do on the first one. Now, the second one also says factor out the common factor. Now, I can obviously see that x minus 5 is a common factor, but if you notice, 3 and 6 also have a common factor of 3. So when I factor that 3 out, the only thing I'm really missing here is the x. Okay, then I'm going to put my plus sign. This came out but three times what will give me six? Three times two will give me six. And so then I've successfully factor out the common factor. Now here it says factor the difference of two squares. So first thing you need to do is these are not two squares, first of all. So that should be a clue that there's a common factor that needs to be done first. So always take out your greatest common factor first okay and so between these two they don't have any variables any x's in common but i can divide them both by seven and so 63 divided by seven is nine 28 divided by seven is four and so when i multiply that in i do get these values so i have done that correctly and then i know that nine is three squared and i know that four x squared is two x squared so the seven will go here. And then according to that difference of two squares formulas, I have a three here and a three here because the nine is in the front and a two X and a two X here because the four X squared is in the back. One will have a plus and one will have the minus. It doesn't matter if you put the minus here and the plus there or vice versa like I have, you'll still get the same answer. Okay, um, this doesn't have any more powers, neither does this one. So this is factored completely, which is what the directions asked us to do. So we first factored off the GCF, then we factored using the difference of two squares. So here it wants me to factor out again, 
Um, but here I don't have a GCF. It doesn't have any U's in common and you never factor out a one because it doesn't do anything if you factor out a one, nothing changes. So I just need to figure out what is being squared here. I'm not sure. 2401 u to the fourth equals something squared. I can guess for the u. I know that u squared squared will give me u to the fourth, but what about 2401? Let me take the square root of 2401. Ah, 49. So apparently 49 times 49 equals 2401, okay? So I did figure out what was being squared there. And then one, of course, is always just one squared. So I'm gonna set up the two parentheses, um, 49 u squared in the front to get me this number in the front, the ones in the back, one should have a plus and one of them should have a minus. Okay, let's see, number five. Ah, so this one does not have a number in front. So if it doesn't have a number in front, that means they're ones. And remember I told you you can't factor out ones. This doesn't have an X, so you can't factor out Xs. So there's no GCF in this one. So I'm gonna go straight to that method that we were using. Well, one times negative 72 is just negative 72. What is the square root of 72? I don't know. Square root of 72. I'm going to hit the double arrow to get a decimal, and it's eight point something. So I'm going to go down this list all the way until I get to eight. Then I'm going to do 72 divided by one, 72 divided by two. 72 divided by three, I think is 14. Nope, I was wrong, 24. 72 divided by four. 72 divided by five is a decimal, so this one doesn't work. 72 divided by six. 72 divided by seven, another decimal. 72 divided by eight, and I get nine. Now, what's supposed to happen? We need to look at this. I am gonna have one of these columns is gonna be negative and the other one positive, so that when I multiply, I end up with the negative, but the bigger number needs to be a negative. So that means these are going to be negative and the ones in the front will be positive. And so then let's do those computations to see which one will give us a negative one, okay? And I see it already at the bottom because eight plus negative nine does equal negative one. So this is the pair that I'm gonna need, okay? And because there's no number in front, I can just say X and a positive eight and X and a negative nine and I'm done, okay? Now for the next one, it does have a number in front so, so far, I'm going to do everything exactly the same up to this point, okay? Then after that, I can't shortcut to the answer. I have to go the little bit longer route with the grouping, okay? So I am going to multiply these two together. 3 times negative 16 is a negative 48. So I'm going to write that off over here. Um, what is the square root of 48? Square root of 48 double arrow is about 6.9 something or another. So I'm gonna go one, two, three, four, five, and six. So 48 divided by one is 48. 48 divided by two is 24. 48 divided by three is 16. 48 divided by four is 12. 48 divided by five is a decimal. And 48 divided by six, I believe is eight, yes. Okay, now it is going to need to be a negative. So one of these columns is gonna to have to be negative. And since the middle is negative, that tells me that the big number, the big column, whatever's in the middle, that's the sign of the big column. And since I need a negative, this needs to be positive. 
Otherwise, you'd have negative and a negative, which makes positive. It's not supposed to be positive. It's supposed to be a negative 48. So once I know what the signs are, we just got to find the ones that give us two. And I think that's going to be these guys, right? Six plus a negative eight does give me negative two. Now, remember, once we find that set of numbers, we don't just write x plus six and x minus eight. We have to split this guy using these two numbers. So don't forget, because this guy has a variable on it, when you split it, those numbers also have to have that same variable in the middle. So this is gonna be a positive six x minus an eight x. And if you combine these two variables together, you do get that negative 2x. Then from here, we're going to group. So the left side has a 3 and an x in common, which gives me x plus 2. If you're not sure, distribute that in and make sure you get these two entries. I must bring down that minus sign. And these two can both be divided by 8. And you should get the same as this parentheses. So I'm going to write x plus 2, but I am going to double check that that's correct. I do get both of those values, so it is good. If you don't, then this is probably not the GCF. If you don't, if this doesn't multiply to give you that. Okay, now what do the two sides have in common? Well, the only thing they have in common is x plus 2. And so what do I have left over? The 3x and the 8. Okay, and then that's the total factorization there. Okay, we've got another one, a pretty big one. So this was one of those special ones, and I kind of X'd it out when we got to that section because you don't need to memorize more rules, okay? If it's a trinomial, just do the method that we're using for trinomials. So 25 times 9. I get 2, 2, 5. What is the square root of 2, 2, 5? It's 15. So I'm going to have to go down this list all the way to 15, just so we can get all of the possibilities. So let's see. This 2, 2, 5 divided by 1 is 2, 2, 5. 2, 2, 5 divided by 2 is decimal. 2, 2, 5 divided by 3 is 75. Since it can't be divided by 2, it's not going to be able to be divided by any other even number. Um, so I'm just going to cross off all the even numbers because they're all going to be decimals. Now, 2, 2, 5 divided by 5 is 45. 2, 2, 5 divided by 7. Nope. 225 divided by 9. 225 divided by 13. Oh, 11. Nope. 225 divided by 13. And 225 divided by 15. And 15. And so remember, this is a positive times a positive, which gave me a positive 225. And we need, this is a positive, so they're going to be the same sign, either both negative or both positive. That's the only way you'll get a, a positive when you multiply. But we know that the bigger one needs to be negative, right? So we know these need to be negative. But in order for me to multiply and get a positive, these also have to be negative. And so which of these is going to combine to give me that negative 30 in the middle? It's going to be this one. Negative 15 plus negative 15 is that negative 30. So I'm going to break this up. 25x squared, and I'm going to write negative 15x and negative 15x. And so then I'm going to chop it in half. This side can be divided by 5, and they have an x in common. So I get 5x minus 3. The middle sign must come down. These guys could both be divided by 3. I end up with positive 5x minus 3. Double check that you do get these two terms. 
And then this side and that side both have a 5x minus 3 in common. But if I took it out, I'd have a 5x left on the left side. And if I took that out, I'd have a minus 3 left on the right-hand side. Since they're the exact same thing, you can write it as 5x minus 3 squared. Okay, And that special product formula, um, we basically had to recognize that um, this was a perfect square, this was a perfect square, and if you multiplied those perfect squares together and then doubled them, you would get 30, and then knowing that, you would end up with that square root and this square root with this symbol in the middle squared, okay? But again, I like to memorize less stuff because it's already a bunch that you have to memorize. Um, the less that I have to memorize, the better. So one less formula, as long as I get the big, the big process, I'm good. And this process works with all trinomials. That formula only works with a special kind of trinomial. Okay, these special kinds of trinomials. But this method works for all trinomials. Now, here we have two terms. So the thing I want to do is try to factor out a GCF, but there is not one between these two numbers. The only things that go into here are fives or factors of five, and fives does not go into that. This doesn't have any t's either, so I don't have any variables in common. So I am going to go straight into the factoring of difference of two cubes, cubes, because this is a power of three. So let me see, the square root of 729 is 27. So this is 27. Um, no, I'm sorry, I'm not doing the square root, I'm doing the cube. I'm not doing the square root, I'm doing the cube root. So let's see, what is the cube root? You need to know how to put that in your calculator. So here is the regular square root. This is any kind of root. So I'm gonna type in three second, and then this button up here, and notice it turns the three into a tiny cube root. And then I'm gonna type 729. And I actually get nine T, cubed is 729 t. And then here, 3, this, 125. Okay, so now I know what the perfect cubes are. I'm going to use that formula. So the formula says for me to write 9t and 5, and whatever symbol's here, that's the same symbol that goes in the middle. Then I'm going to do 9t times itself. That gives me 81t squared. Whatever this sign is, the next one is opposite. 9t times 5 is 45t. The last one's always a positive. And then 5 times 5 is 25. And so this is the factorization using the difference of cubes. Okay, so here it wants me to factor out the trinomial. Just FYI, if you have a negative, you must factor out that negative. Um, but I don't see that these have anything else in common. These have something in common, but not with the seven. And it has to have it in common with all three terms. So the only thing I'm going to do is factor out the negative, which is going to turn this guy positive, this guy positive, and this guy negative. Now, when I continue with the process, it does have a number in front, so I do need to do the AC method. But I'm only working on this. My final answer will have the two bubbles like this with a minus on the outside. Okay, so I'm going to strictly take this polynomial off to the side and try to factor it. Okay, so 7 times negative 16 is negative 112, and the square root of 112 is 10 point something. So I'm going to go 1, 2, 3, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And so then one, one, two divided by one, 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 two divided by two, I think it's 56. 
one, one, two divided by three is a decimal divided by four is 28 divided by five is a decimal divided by six is a decimal divided by seven is 16 divided by eight is 14 divided by nine is a decimal and divided by 10 is a decimal. So it outrolled a bunch of them. I do have five different options here though. Since the middle number, remember I'm not working with this anymore. I'm working with this. So since the middle one is positive, that means that the bigger one will be positive. But I do need to multiply to get a negative, which means that the littler ones will have to be a negative, okay? So then which of these will give me 24 when I combine them? It's actually this pair right here. Negative four plus 28 does give me a positive 24. So I'm gonna split this. Um, that 24y is gonna become negative four y and positive 28y. Let me bring this guy in, I wrote him too far out. Okay, now here I'm gonna chop it in half. Always make sure that if you combine these two that they do give you that middle term. Now this side has a Y in common. I must bring down that plus sign. This side has a two in common. Oh no, they have a four in common. You must take out the greatest common factor. So they actually can both be divided by four which makes sense because I should have the same thing in parentheses, right? And if I used a two, this would have been 14 and then they wouldn't have matched. But four times that is that, four times this is this, so we're good. These two sides have a seven Y minus four in common. And if I took that seven Y minus four out, I would end up with Y plus four. So now I know what goes in here. And this is the final factorization. Okay, last problem. You would try to see if there's a common factor for the whole thing, but there's not. This has no variables, that has no number, so no GCF. So the next thing I'm gonna do is just chop it in half. So these guys actually have an X squared in common, leaving me with four X plus one. Remember this times this has to equal that, this times this has to equal that. I must bring down the minus. These two guys can both be divided by seven. So I should end up with four X plus one, the same as this, but let's double check. Negative seven times four X, yes. Negative seven times positive one, yes. So then the two sides have the four X plus one in common and I'm left with X squared minus seven. If this was a perfect square, I would factor this some more, but it's not, so this is the final answer. And that is the end of this section. Now you have the processes, so definitely come back to these videos for reference as far as the processes, but those numbers are gonna be different for every single problem you get. So they're never going to be exactly like each example that I've shown. And there's no possible way that I can show you every single problem, okay? So you just have to learn the processes. And once you get down that process, you can factor any trinomial. Once you get down the grouping process, you can factor any uh, four-termed polynomial. And once you get down the GCF and the difference of squares, difference of cubes, sum of cubes, you can factor all your tri your binomials, okay? So that is factoring. We will be factoring throughout the entire course. You will also factor a whole bunch in pre-cal. You'll factor a bunch in Cal 1, Cal 2, Cal 3. Factoring never ends, okay? You must, must, must get this process down. Okay, it is super important, super helpful in the future. There's no way around it. This is one of those big concepts that you're just going to see all the time. And believe it or not, the factoring process, this whole process, 
like you're expected to do that whole process so super turbo fast okay mm -hmm. like very fast okay so i know you're going to take it slow while you're in this section because you're learning but when we get to the classroom um, and we start getting to those later sections factoring is just like a little mini step okay it's not the entire step of the problem it's just a tiny little mini step and so you definitely want to master it before we continue it's very important but that concludes our section and i will stop the video here and as always if you get questions while you're doing the assignment you get stuck on a problem you, you know something i did in here doesn't make sense please 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 text me let me know and i can get anything clarified for you asap